Hi everyone and welcome to Menopause Mindset Monday. How are you? Have you had a lovely weekend? Let me know how you are. Let me know if you're watching. Drop me a comment. Say hi. Be lovely to know who's watching. So, oh, excuse me. <coughs> um, to this, so this week's Mental Health Awareness Week. Did you know that? I literally just found out this morning that it's Mental Health Awareness Week and I thought that was rather apt because um, I know that women who are in the perimenopause have to really up their self-care game in order to deal with their mental wellness and um, mental health can be a little bit compromised in perimenopause so it's really important to to work with that so it's really good that we can raise awareness this week so I'm probably going to do a few posts around that this week so today's topic is all about joint pain and um, why do we get it at menopause and what can we do about it how can we ease it it's really um, some people really suffer with with actual pain in actual joints really specifically, but many of us suffer with just general overall stiffness. So why don't you let me know if you've suffered with any kind of joint pain or stiffness um, and we can get this conversation going really. And it is one of the lesser known symptoms of menopause. You know, we all know about the hot flushes, the insomnia, the grumpiness, the painful periods, whatever. But we don't necessarily associate joint pain with um, perimenopause. In fact, a friend of mine, she's not in this group, but she won't mind me saying, I won't mention any names anyway. Um, she had a large fibroid in her uterus. And at the same time, she had got a frozen shoulder. And we didn't really realize that the two might be linked. But when I started doing my perimenopause course and learned a lot about estrogen dominance and um, joint pain and stiffness, we thought there might be a link. So she's investigating that at the moment. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? You don't think that shoulder and a uterus can be linked, but, but it can be. Um, I know that thyroid anyone that's got like a hypothyroid can be at risk for frozen shoulder I mean who knew hormones play such a big part in everything hi Rachel hi TJ thanks for saying hello um so yeah for me joint stiffness started about four years ago so the anxiety started at 38 I'm now 44 um, and the, the joint stiffness kicked in about four years ago. Um, so it wasn't really the first thing to manifest, but I did wonder if it was part of a bigger picture. Turned out it was. Definitely associated with weight gain and definitely associated with high stress levels as well. And repetitive use, you know, being forward hunched over a computer and over a phone and things like that, which we all are these days. So um, joint pain and stiffness, it is a part of the natural aging process. So as we age, collagen and elastin becomes less flexible. And we also, our, our vascular system becomes less flexible as well. So it could be that there's less blood flow to the joints as well. So you know, that could be reasons why. We also, um, you know, estrogen is in decline at perimenopause and estrogen has over 400 functions in the body. So as it starts to decline, we start to feel the effects of that everywhere in every system of the body and musculoskeletal is no different. So what can trigger joint pain? Let's talk about pain for the moment. So things like a sudden overload of weight on a particular joint and what can happen is menopausal women who are doing a new exercise regime might go into it guns blazing, you know, too much too soon kind of thing. We can get all enthusiastic and if we lift a weight that is too heavy for us, perhaps if we haven't warmed up enough, then that joint is not going to like it and there'll be a, a sharp pain and everything will stiffen up around it. You'll get cytokines, which are inflammatory cells, which will flood to that joint and stiffen it all up as a protection. So we've all had that, haven't we, where we've moved a bit sharply or we've moved a bit quickly and then, then everything stiffens up. So that can 
be a trigger for joint pain, but equally not enough load on the joint. So if the joint or the muscles and the ligaments and the tendons around the joint are weak, um, that can have an impact. You know, muscle weakness, sarcopenia, when the muscle loses its strength, loses its like, um, I don't know what you call it, but sarcopenia is like muscle wasting. So we do need to load the joint for strength and to encourage it to to strengthen up. So and so, if it's if we don't load the joint enough, then that can cause problems when we maybe go to lift a shopping bag or lift washing or get in and out of the car. If we don't have strong, supple, lubricated joints, um, they can they can get a bit achy and painful. So what makes joint pain worse? So I said it before actually, weight weight gain can make joint pain worse, lack of activity can make joint pain worse, um, stagnation of energy in the joint, stagnation of blood flow in the joints, things like diabetes are, is a really high risk factor for joint pain and like I said thyroid has been linked to or hypothyroid or thyroid dysfunction has been linked to frozen shoulder as well. So um, we really do need to look again it all comes down to lifestyle so looking at our sleep you know if we don't sleep very well we're going to be stiff equally if we sleep really really deeply we can wake up quite stiff as well. So um, nutrition plays a big role, stress and lifestyle will all play into joint pain too. But for me, the most interesting um, idea around joint pain is the metaphysical. So the metaphysical really means the emotional underlying cause of joint pain and stiff joints really reflect an inner stiffness. So this could be like a like a, a rigid mindset, a stubbornness, a resistance to opening up, to expressing a certain amount of creativity. So the purpose of the joints is to move freely, to express ourselves. When we look at what the joints do, they help us to create. So, you know, a piano player will use every joint in the fingers to create beautiful music. We use our joints to move our body in dance. We use our joints to paint a picture. We use our joints to cook and to do any kind of creative pursuit. So where there is a rigidity, where there is a mental stubbornness, we are um, it can manifest physically in the joints as well. So joints represent free emotional expression um, and also uh, a lack of mental flexibility. That's a, another thing as well. And perhaps as we get older, there's an indication around that. I'm going to talk about that later, actually. So, um, yeah, so we have to look deeper than just the physical. We have to go into the emotional because... Um, structural deformities of the joint don't necessarily mean that you are going to have symptoms. So you can go under the scanner, you can see that a joint is um, doesn't have great a great structure, maybe something's gone wrong with the joint, but that person might be asymptomatic, they might not have any symptoms at all. So you, you can have a deformed joint but no symptoms. Um, and equally you might have symptoms but no deformity in the joint. So you do have to look beyond structure and you have to look into the cells and you have to look deep, 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 deep into the cells, into the memory, into the emotions, into someone's stress levels as well. Because our mind and body are inextricably linked. I know it's a bit of a cliche now, but you can't separate your mind, your emotions and your body. You just can't. All right, so how do we work to remedy stiff and painful joints? I've got seven. <laughs> I said three in my little event um, page, but turns out there's seven and there's probably way more. <laughs> All right, so number one, if you have a specific joint pain and joint problem, I would advise going to see a physiotherapist. And I, I really... I personally prefer physiotherapists 
chiropractors or osteopaths. If there are any chiropractors or osteopaths in this group who wish to prove me wrong, then please go ahead. The reason I like going to see physio is because you get exercises from them. Um, and you do, you might get a little bit of soft tissue manipulation, but it's mainly about what you can do for you. So they show you what exercises you can do to strengthen the joint, to mobilize the joint, to get the joint moving again. So, um, so yeah, it's great to go and see a physio, but again, um, it's good to not rely on something outside of yourself. So so like a, going to see an acupuncturist, for example, will give you a good short-term sense of relief, but it's good to not rely on those external things. So I, I believe in agency. I believe we all have the power within us to change a certain ailment or a certain habit or a certain mindset. I, I believe that we can do that through our subconscious reprogramming and through our will and through our awareness, through our, our self-talk. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm a big believer in massage and acupuncture and physio as a short-term solution, much like ibuprofen or, or a drug, for example. So what I also love about going to see a physio is that they will often help you do a lifestyle check. If they're a good physio, they will talk to you about the wider aspect of your life and your lifestyle because there's no getting away from, from the neurology um, of it as well. So they'll empathize with you. They'll look at you to assess your lifestyle. They'll ask you about your sleep, your nutrition, which will trigger your own thoughts about you know where you're at with your lifestyle so it's really good i'm all for going to see a physio if you've got a specific issue um and yeah heat is another thing that i recommend alongside this sort of practice popping heat on a joint can really 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 help i know for me i had debilitating sciatica about three years ago and it just went on and on and on and on. I was doing the heat packs. I'd, I was seeing um, a trainer to help me mobilize the joint, which was all fine. It was all good, but it just kept going on and on and on. And then that beautiful hot weather kicked in. And literally within the space of two weeks, it just got better and better and better. And it, it, it completely healed. So heat climate the climate that you live in can play a big role in joint stiffness and i know um one of my friends has degenerative arthritis in her entire spine and every time she goes to cyprus it feels so much better and she comes back to the uk and it's really because it's so cold here sometimes we we stiffen up against the cold to protect ourselves but if we can learn to relax the more we can learn to relax and not protect against cold you know it's imagining the fire within that can help saunas also really good for things like joint stiffness all right number two number two is about movement move to improve um so we need to move but we need to move in many different ways to maintain our joint suppleness as we get older especially we need to move more as we get older than we did when we were younger. In fact, don't stop moving, right? <laughs> just don't, just keep moving. Obviously you can have intermittent rest periods, but keep moving. Ah, Rachel, you've suffered with a frozen shoulder for almost a year. Heat was one of the only things that helped with the pain, especially hot shower on the area. Something really interesting coming up about frozen shoulder. Um, yeah, I've never had it, but a mate of mine had it. And, oh, the pain that she was in, I just can't imagine. I've, I've crooked my neck before, and that's awful. Um, and I've had, I have had surgery on my spine. So I do understand the whole joint pain thing. Um, but, yeah. Right, so movement, movement. We need to move in three different ways for joint suppleness. Mobility, strength, and flexibility, so stretching. So mobility is, you know, when we're moving gently and slowly all through the day, we get that constant 
um, supply of synovial fluid to the joint. And, you know, if you're doing gardening or if you're doing a job where you're moving around a lot, then that's great. But mobility exercises are definitely something that we need to be integrating into our daily life much more as we get older. So shoulder rolls, neck rolls. Um, I've got one of these little balls by my desk and I just keep squeezing it if my hands get a bit stiff or stretching. I'll come to stretching in a minute. But yeah, mobility, always start your workout with some mobility. You know, this synovial fluid is like the best ointment, the best balm for your joints. And without synovial fluid, we can cause quite a lot of damage to the joint. It's like a car running without any oil. All the components are just going to and lock up, aren't they? So, all right. So the other thing is strength. We need to build strength as we get older. So sarcopenia sets in, which is muscle loss, muscle wastage. So, you know, we need to do more strength training the older we get, actually, than we do when we're younger. Now, I don't mean going into the gym and start lifting like 20, 30, 40, 50 kilos. I'm not talking about that. Do what you can to build strength. Buy some of those resistance bands, buy some of those soft weight plates, buy some light dumbbells. Um, this is about just training you for life, for activities that you need to be able to do on a daily basis, like unloading the dishwasher, getting shopping out of the car and things like that. So um, start with light weights and build up slowly. I would advise doing this with a trainer if you've never exercised before and you're perimenopausal. Um, really, it's about, you know, don't go at strength training guns blazing. You've got to do it in a way that is supportive of you, where you're at, your energy levels, your current level of mobility. So yeah, start with light weights, build up slowly, don't let your ego get in the way. And I love resistance bands because they're very, very portable and you can't do too much damage with them unless you trip over them, of course. So stretching, stretching is an absolute must as well, doing what you can to stretch a joint in every direction. So really looking at the full range of movement. And if you've got a frozen shoulder, obviously your range of movement is going to be quite limited, but doing what you can. And I'm going to come up to pain in a minute. Um, so yeah, the, so stretching is a must. The muscles and tendons that support joints need to be stretched out. Stretching detoxifies the joints, detoxifies the muscles, and helps everything to run smoothly because tight muscles don't function properly. Tight muscles just play havoc with joints. So everything's got to be stretched out. And as we stretch, we release the connective tissue as well, the fascia that runs, that connects every single muscle in the body. So yeah, doing some yoga. Um, I put here a hint, don't, don't stay in one position for too long. Get up and move about even in the evenings. Do yoga while you're watching TV, just you know, stretching your fingers bending them back. If you get stuck in one position for too long, then you need to stretch yourself the other way, right? So yeah, wrists, ankles, anything that you need to do, just keep moving, keep moving. Don't stop, just keep moving. Because <laughs> you know how achy you are when you wake up in the morning, right? You've not been moving for eight hours or whatever. You wake up, you can be really, really stiff. So we just need to keep moving. Okay. Number three, you may or may not want to hear this, but quitting cane sugar is really valuable if you are prone to achy joints. So eating a lot of sweets has been shown to worsen joint pain, significantly worsen joint pain because cane sugar, white or brown, is highly inflammatory. Um, I think you won't, you literally only need like three grams of sugar a day and you can get that from eating a date or some fruit or um, yeah, something natural. Um, and studies show that increased sugar consumption can really increase your risk of rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. Arthritis, any kind of itis is inflammatory and sugar increases your inflammation. So there's no way around it, people. I'm really, really sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but sugar is just 
don't like it, don't want to be involved with it. I'm a bit of a rebel when it comes to sugar because I know how much um, goes into, how much plotting and uh, manipulation goes into sugar content from the food companies. Um, there's so much plotting. We haven't got a hope in hell <laughs> of, of well, we do. I mean, okay, let me, let me go back. Let me just come down off my high horse and relax myself a minute. So there are people employed by the big corporations to come up with the bliss point, which is the amount of salt and sugar in a processed product, which will leave you unable to satiate yourself. That's why Pringles, you once you pop, you can't stop. And that sort of unsatiability exists in most processed foods. Um, and so my belief is, you know, this is manipulation. This is just corporate manipulation of the masses. And I don't want anything to do with it. So, you know, um, even down to things like birthday cakes, I really try not to buy into the whole sugar is joy, sugar is celebration. It's not. So much pain comes from it, including joint pain, diabetes. It's really not. You know, sugar is is pain. And it's it's making that link in your brain, really. So I like to think of myself as a sugar rebel. And I would like to invite you to become a sugar rebel as well. Don't buy into it. Um, you know, um, crisps, uh, chocolate. I, I do eat chocolate, but I eat 85% cacao, organic, dark chocolate, because dark chocolate has loads of antioxidants and some really good superfood. But the sugar that goes into it, not so much. 100% dark chocolate, much better for you. I have it in the morning as a bit of a kickstarter. So no sugar. <laughs> Foods which help your joints your omega-3s basically, your cod liver oils, your oily fish, your mackerel, your salmon, smoked salmon, sardines, um, yeah, any kind of oily fish is gonna be really, really good for you. Um, and plants, 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 and more plants, and uh, nuts and seeds. Seeds are really oily as well. You, If you're vegetarian, you get your omega-3s from flax, yeah. So upping the intake of plants. I mean, even like excessive amounts of meat. I'm not anti-meat, but I'm not pro-meat either. I think you have to balance it out because if you eat a lot of meat, especially processed meats, that can cause inflammation as well. TJ, you're a sugar rebel too. Woohoo! Join the club. <laughs> All right, number four, hydration. Hydration is so important. Now, obviously, it's important to up your water intake, and by that I mean um, filtered water. Unless you live, you know, in in the Alps and you've got access to the purest mountain spring water, then please don't bother filtering it. But if you're like me and your water is really laden with fluoride, with um, uh, chlorine, <laughs> with these black bits that are just floating around. Um, it's not very nice. You don't want to put that shit in your body. Filter it out. And what I've started doing now is adding a small amount of electrolyte powder to my water first thing in the morning, um, just for hydration, really. And I have found that this has really helped joint stiffness. So definitely worth looking at some kind of electrolyte solution. You don't want too much of it because it can be very salty. Um, you can buy like Dioralite and stuff, but that's got sugar in and sweeteners. So I would just opt for the, the non-flavored stuff. Um, to me, it doesn't matter if it doesn't taste nice. I just neck it anyway. Yeah. So hydration is a must. I mean, you've got to look, I think there's an equation that you can use to work out how much water you actually need. TJ, you might know this. Um, you're a data girl, but you got to look, you you're looking at your body weight. Um, what one do I use? What the electrolyte? I will let you know, TJ. I'll pop a link and I'll let you know. Um, yeah, if you pop into Google, like how much should I drink for my body weight? Is 
body mass. It, it's quite surprising. You need more than you think, actually. Um, and it's quite hard to get the amount of water in every day. So buying some kind of bottle, um, like a two litre bottle, you know you've got to drink all that then. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So I'm just going to have a quick slurp of my tea. Oh, that's lovely. That's a puck of tea. What is it? It's a nighttime tea, actually, which I'm having during the day. <laughs> right. Number five, supplements. Um, vitamin D is sort of at the top of the chain, really, when it comes to perimenopause. Um, we, we need vitamin D for cholesterol production. Um, cholesterol is not all bad. So, and, and our hormones, our female hormones come from cholesterol. So vitamin D really is at the top of the chain, making sure you take vitamin D, fairly high doses of it as well, um, through your, through the whole year, especially if you live in a dark country. Um, so yeah, really good as well, like for joint pain, um, if you're perimenopausal or menopausal, looking into what HRT you can get. So I take Body Identical HRT, which is just a really weak estrogen gel coupled with a natural progesterone, which comes from Wild Yam. I get that from my doctor. So if you are thinking of HRT, you're not on it and you want a natural um, HRT, just ask your doctor about Body Identical HRT, not Bio Identical because they're unregulated, um, but body identical. Um, yes. So other things that can help with joint pain, if you're, if you're really stiff or you really want to work on your joint flexibility, you might want to look at taking collagen. Uh, there's marine collagen, there's collagen that comes from cows as well. So I'm not quite sure of the ethics around that, but you can definitely look into taking some kind of collagen supplement if you, uh, just as a kind of anti-aging remedy as well. I know my collagen's quite good. Uh, you can test it, see how your collagen and elastin, if your, if your skin doesn't go down, that's an indication that your collagen and elastin is not as it could be. So you can see my, my skin pops down really nicely there. And I don't, um, I don't age particularly, I haven't got many wrinkles in my face, which I'm I don't know how that's happened. I'm very grey in my hair. <laughs> so maybe that's an indication of ageing. But um, yeah, so I don't actually take collagen because I don't feel I need to. But if you've got very baggy skin, that might be um, an indication for you to take it. Another supplement which is traditionally used for joint aches and pains are, is glucosamine mixed with chondrotin sulfate. I've never tried it, but I have heard about it. Um tell a lie. I think I did try it once when I had sciatica. Um, not sure how much it helped. It's really hard to know sometimes with supplements what's helping. Um, that's why I think when you do embark on a supplementation protocol, you should really do it very, very intentionally like you are your own doctor really. So start low and slow and then build up over time and take them for you know three months or so. See how you feel at the end and either keep going or come off a few or stop, give your body a clean out and then start again so that you can really test how you feel. Um, also great if you have lost weight. Yes. Oh, what collagen. Yeah. Yeah, actually really good. Maybe if you've got some saggy skin. Mm. Um, turmeric as well is a brilliant anti-inflammatory. If you are going to take turmeric, then please take it mixed with black pepper and a fat, like a coconut fat. You can buy it in powdered form. Um, there's a really strong one that I've used called Turmeric X or Turmerex. I think it's called, it's really expensive, but it, oh my God, it was amazing. Um, yeah, all my stiffness just went overnight, but... <laughs> Uh, I can't really afford to keep going with that at the moment. And also, yeah, it's just not on my radar right now. But turmeric is good. So maybe incorporating it into your cooking or turmeric teas are really nice. Turmeric lattes are really lovely. 
but you do need a fairly good dose of it for it to have a medicinal property. All right, so that's food, that's supplements, that's movement, that's physio. So I want to talk to you now about the emotional work because this is what I love. All right, so number six, do the emotional work. If you are suffering with joint pain, joint stiffness, there may be some underlying emotional stuff, some residue, some patterns that you're not quite seeing. So metaphysically, we can look at the underlying emotional root causes of certain ailments. So the purpose, the purpose of joints, as I said before, is to move freely and to express ourselves through movement, through painting, through dancing, through sex, through running, through whatever. Um, and that's the purpose of our joints, to give us this flexibility so that we can express life. But here's the thing, as we get older, there's this cultural expectation that we get stiffer. If you look around at the old people you know, are they stiff? Do they have bulging joints? Are they kind of, oh, moaning and aching every time they get out of the chair? What pictures are you seeing on the TV about old people, older people? We are hypnotized by the media to believe that as we get older, we get stiffer, we degenerate. And what is expected tends to be realized, right? There's a saying in hypnotherapy, what is expected tends to be realized, especially if it's subconscious. So again, I would urge you to be a rebel on that and I would urge you to call bullshit <laughs> on that and to look for anti-aging stories. So look for people to follow on social media who are aging differently and that will help your mind to have a different expectation of aging. I'm quite lucky actually because my dad is 83 He's very upright, he's very mobile, his brain, his cognitive um, health is good and he's always exercising, he's always moving, he's always pushing himself and he still rides his motorbikes even today. So I have a, a really good um, visual representation of somebody that's aging well and I've had that since I was a young person. So that's really good. But um, it's not quite the same for my mum. So there's two different stories going on there. But we really have to write our own rules and our own expectations of what we feel aging looks like. All right, so metaphysically then, where have your thoughts become stiff or rigid? So this is again doing an internal audit, asking yourself these questions and pondering the answers. Maybe you can write them down or maybe you could just let them float around in your brain, in your mind for a bit whilst walking or just staring at a wall or meditating. Um, right, so where have your thoughts become rigid or stiff? Do you feel you cannot share your feelings? Where have you become stiff and inflexible with yourself or the world around you? Where have you lost your purpose or direction? Who or what is making you angry or irritated or critical? How can you become more fluid and more flexible? Have you become rigid or unbending? How can you express your deeper feelings a bit more? Where do you need to loosen up? So there's quite a lot of food for thought in there. So I'm just going to leave that one with you to ponder that. And you are quite welcome to come back into the group and let me know what your findings have been. You can post or do a little live. That's absolutely fine. All right, and now number seven, and I think this is the most interesting. Um, number seven, tell your brain that your joints are flexible. See, so Rachel, you have frozen shoulder. This is the thing that I wanted you to wait for. I want you to see your arm going up. We're gonna do a little exercise in a minute actually. Um, but before we do that exercise, 
I want to tell you about a little bit of research that I found yesterday. So there was a very small study done on six people by this doctor who had frozen shoulder who were about to have arthroscopic capsular release surgery. So their range of motion was measured before the anaesthetic and after the anaesthetic, but before surgery. And what they found is their range of motion significantly improved after the anaesthetic before the surgery. So the conclusion was with frozen shoulder, there's a certain amount of guarding going on because when you're under anaesthetic, your conscious mind is gone, your subconscious mind is gone, even your unconscious mind is gone, right? So there's no, you can't guard so with joint stiffness or limited mobility, what they found was they could move the arm, the body, any which way because there was no guarding. And this this is what happened to me as well. So I had um, a slipped disc, L5S1, and my disc popped out. It was so painful, eye-wateringly painful for like six weeks, three months really. And I had to have surgery on it and I couldn't lay flat. And the only position that was comfortable was bent over, forward bent over to obviously release the space in the back and on my side in a specific position. Now, obviously when I was out, they could move me around in, in whatever way um, they needed to, to get me in a position for surgery. So how much of this plays into the emotional side of things too? So where do we guard? Where do we control and protect and hold on in our own lives? Where can we become more fluid and flexible? So, um, yeah, when it comes to our own joint pain, how much of it is guarding? And many, many physiotherapists are realizing this, this neurological link between um, joint movement and sensation as well. So I want to tell you a little bit about my recovery and in that I really had to move into the pain. And this is what I wanted to tell you, Rachel, is when it comes to frozen shoulder or any, or any kind of joint that's got really stiff, we have to, in a way, move towards the pain. Now, I'm not talking about sharp pain. Sharp pain is different. If there's, a, if there's a sharp pain, that's different. That's stress on the joint. That's like gonna freeze it. But moving towards the discomfort and into the discomfort and breathing into the discomfort, <sighs> helping it to move on its way is actually what we need to do to free the joint up. So, um, it's okay to feel a little pain when it comes to getting the mobility back into a joint, as long as it's not sharp. We associate pain in joints with damage, but in the physio world, a lot of it is about neuroplasticity and moving into the pain to train the joint and the brain that everything is okay. I do this a lot in yoga. Like if I find that I'm, I, I can't reach, you know, that one. <laughs> Um, I will see the hands coming together or I will tell myself, go further. And I'll do it really mindfully. And you can absolutely do that as well. Do it with the breath, do it with the visualization, do it in collaboration with your sensation and your willingness to move into the pain for the sake of your growth. So this is about this idea that discomfort is not the same as suffering. Suffering is staying on your stump, but discomfort is moving into pain for the sake of your growth. And it's no different with the joints. So after I had my surgery, I had to get my formation back. My hips were completely out of alignment. I was bent over. I couldn't stand up straight. Um, there's a bit of deformity going on. And obviously after the surgery, there was no reason for me to be in that position anymore, but I still was. And so I had to, the muscles had become set in this very weird position. And so I had to move into the pain for like a few seconds and breathe and breathe and then move back into where it wasn't painful and then keep doing that three times a day. In fact, I did it more than that. I did it pretty much all the time. 
And my physiotherapist said that she'd never seen anybody recover so quickly. Um, so that was really good. And um, I was on an anti-inflammatory diet as well. So, so we're gonna try one exercise. Um, I'm gonna stand up for this. Okay, so I want you to, you're gonna hold your arm out in front of you like this, and you're going to turn your arm around and you're going to take it as far as it will go. And you're going to mark with your finger where you are on the wall behind you, okay? So do that for me now. Breathe and then come back. Now, what I want you to do now is tell your mind to take you a third further round, okay? So just talk to the joint and say, right, what I want you to do is just go around a third further. I'm gonna do that, it's gonna be easy. So let's do it. So a third further. And there we go. And you will see, hopefully, how much further your arm can go. Let me know how you got on with that. I'd be really interested to find out um, if you did manage to go a third further. I'm sure you did. So, you know, what does this tell us? It tells us that our, our conscious mind, our subconscious mind really does play into movement, motion, flexibility, flow. It's everything. And often we do get stiff in our joints because our mind has become so rigid. All right. So let's do a quick summary of all of that, of all of that then. So number one, if you've got any joint pain and specific joint stiffness, that's in a specific muscle, go and see a physio. Um, don't try and do it on your own. But the clue there is don't give your power away, all right? Number two, move. We need to move more as we get older, not less. We're looking at mobility, strength training, and flexibility, those three things combined. Number three, quitting that cane sugar, it's no good for you. Increase your plants, increase your fish oils or your omega-3s um, by way of flax. Supplements, you can try some supplements if you want to. Vitamin D is good. You can even try some HRT. Collagen, glucosamine and chondrotin and turmeric. Those are all good ones. Number five, although I think this was number six, so I've gone wrong somewhere. <laughs> Do the emotional work. Ask yourself those questions. Where am I being rigid? Where am I being stubborn? Where, <clears throat> where am I not being flexible? And then the final one, number seven, um, tell your brain that pain is not a reflection um, of your limitation, right? Tell your brain, move into that pain, train yourself that you can go a third further. You can move into it. Remember, discomfort is not the same as suffering. You can move past it. Rachel, thanks for all these tips, Sally. It's been really useful and I will try the exercises you just showed us. Awesome, Rachel. Um, yeah, because I mean, you can't even go and see an acupuncturist at the moment, can you? Which I would recommend. But yeah, just, just try it. Use the breath. Use your intention and let me know how you get on. I'd be really interested to hear from you. All right, my lovely ones, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate uh, you coming on. And um, just a few requests. I ask if you wouldn't mind to share this group with some of your other female friends who you think might be um, perimenopausal or who might want to learn about it. So uh, yeah, menopause doesn't have to be miserable, folks. Um, and just to let you know, on Saturday, I started my work with Kajabi, which is the legendary course, create, course, course creating platform. And I'm creating an online course, my first online course. I'm so excited about sleep, how to make sleep your superpower. I've started creating the videos. I've started creating the worksheets. And um, it's going to be the kind of thing that's drip fed over probably about eight weeks, eight or nine weeks. And community will be a big part of this. So if you are struggling with your sleep or you want to learn how to sleep better, then it could be for you. 
Um, what else? I am, a, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I am applying to do a TED talk, a TEDx talk too. I'm just working on my application form and this is going to be called How Your Mind Affects Your Menopause. So that's it. Remember, I do have a podcast as well. Uh, you can go and search in Spotify or Google Play or Apple iTunes. Just put in the menopause mindset. And I it's not just me. I've got guests on there as well. I'm starting to do guest interviews, which are absolutely fascinating. So if any of you do want to be a guest on my podcast, you've got something to say about your own menopause. You don't have to be an expert. You could just be a normal person navigating your menopause. All right, my lovely ones, thank you so much and I will see you next week.